from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, good afternoon. This is David Klein for the Civil Rights History Project. I work in the History Department at Virginia Tech and have the honor of working with the Civil Rights History Project of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today is June 28th, 2016, and I'm in San Diego, California. Uh, this project is also co-sponsored by the Southern Oral History Program at UNC Chapel Hill, and um, as I said, by the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian. Uh, today we have with us Guha Shankar from the Library of Congress is in the room. Behind the camera is John Bishop of Media Generation and UCLA. Um, we have the distinct honor to be visiting uh, with Harold Brown here in San Diego. And this is the one time that I will coach you at all, is just if you could start with a complete sentence, and then we'll just go into conversation. But uh, my name is, or I am, uh, and your name, and the year of your birth, and, and where you were born. My name is Harold K. Brown, known, uh, better known as Hal. Brown. I was born in York, Pennsylvania and uh, migrated to San Diego uh, through San Diego State University in 1953. Mm -hmm. And you were born when? I was born in 1934 okay. um, and I am uh, the son of, of uh, Mrs. Emma Brown and I am one of seven siblings. Mm -hmm. And could we start with your childhood? You said you were born in Pennsylvania, but yes. if you could tell us a little bit about what your upbringing was like and who your people, uh, who your people were. I'd like to uh, start by saying that, you know, I'm trying to answer the question is what breeds a civil rights activist or a civil rights militant mm -hmm. Uh, as we were called in the 60s. So I grew up in a, in a, in a community, uh, mostly farm community, uh, approximately 1% or less uh, black citizens. And York, Pennsylvania was typical of the United States of America at that time. There was segregated uh, housing. So I grew up in a segregated, what, what was called in those days, a colored community. And uh, we were all rather uh, poor, uh, not poor to the extent that we didn't have food and we didn't have clothing, but we were all in the pretty much the same boat. It was a, it was a, 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 so a group of people who had uh, very few opportunities, if any. We lived, uh, we went to segregated schools up until the seventh grade is when we integrated. Uh, and so jobs were scarce uh, for our families and so income was very, very low. So that's the, uh, the environment I grew up in. And, uh, and there are parts of Pennsylvania, I feel like a lot of people don't know this, that were really, really rough yes. in terms of, of racial prejudice. And, absolutely, and absolutely. People don't think of the North. Mm -hmm. People from the South don't think of the North as being uh, a tough place to live for uh, black people, descendants of slaves, but it was. And when people moved from, when blacks moved from the south to the north, they found that, you know, there was a lot of uh, a hardship there in terms of segregated uh, housing and um, discriminated employment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's what I grew up in and faced a lot of, uh, Insults. One of the stories I tell is that I call it my introduction really to, uh, to racism in America. And that was when I was in elementary school, we had to, we had to go to a uh, uh, black, in quotes, uh, elementary school. And when uh, we 
would walk, oh, somewhere around maybe five, five miles to the school, past white schools to get there. And there was um, um, a chain works factory on en route to our school. And the men used to hang out the windows uh, on the upper floors and, uh, and just hurl all kinds of racial in, in, um, insults, uh, calling us names uh, all the whole time. We were, and it just happened every day. And so that was my introduction at age uh, six, you know. And your children, and those yes. are adults. Yes, yeah. Yeah. just just children. So, hindsight helps us in these things. But look, looking back, can can you start to see where uh, a race consciousness of some kind started to to form for you? That's something that you have a sense of. Absolutely, you know, I I uh, I, I I joke about it when I tell people that. You know, when I was born and came out of the womb, all I saw was the doctor and some nurses, and they were all white. And so I didn't know I was black until my mother took me home to this uh, 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 colored community. And then I began to look around. I saw, you know, these people were different color than the ones I saw when I came into this world. But... Uh, that was sort of the introduction that I like to talk about because it illustrates that there was a difference right from the beginning. And I attribute the, the psychological and mental exposure to this, which had its impact right from the beginning. And the names and the insults and, uh, and the, the observation of uh, no blacks being in positions of importance in the city, all of them were whites and mostly white males. And so this I attribute to the, the, the learning in America of a young black kid growing up. And so there was just a building on that, you know, from going from uh, um, a segregated elementary school to an integrated junior high school and the impact that that had, the, the difference, and I, and I suspect it must have had uh, an impact on the white students as well. But that being the only black in a classroom uh, and experiencing uh, uh, the officers of the school, the teachers of the school, uh, the administrators of the school, you know, it was all, it's, you're in a white world, mm -hmm. and here you are um, uh, being the victim of insults that come, and everything that you see just about uh, uh, substantiates the fact that you are less than the rest of them. And that builds into the mind of a child. And I guess leads to the point where the psychological test where, where black kids say uh, select a white kid as being the, the good kid and the smart kid as opposed to selecting a black kid. Right. Now, were there any forces that you can remember, whether at home or in the school or elsewhere, that were pushing against that for you, that were giving you a different message, a message about black pride? Well, the one that I, uh, I uh, cite the most is that the, the contradiction takes place when I entered uh, junior high school. My homeroom teacher, uh, Cassandra Shea, just sort of adopted me and she was a white math teacher, my homeroom teacher, but she introduced to me the concept of college. 
which I didn't know anything about, never heard of. She introduced me to that and, and explained that out of the blue that you ought to think about going to college, Harold. And, uh, uh, and she explained how she, had, she went to college and her family wasn't, uh, uh, didn't have the, uh, the financial ability to put her through college, so she got a job and she, she worked through college, like uh, cleaning uh, people's houses and so forth. And so, you know, there here was, a, was a, made an impression on me. Uh, and then when my uh, football coach there in junior high school says uh, to me, Hal, you know, you ought to be a dentist. And I go, you know, dentist? I mean, that was farthest from me. I never knew a dentist, never saw anybody, you know, a black professional just was not heard of. We had a few black teachers who taught in black schools, but to have a black person in the community as a, as a, as a dentist, a doctor, and so forth, we had one black doctor and uh, no black dentist, but that coach of mine introduced me to some things that I had not even thought about. So, you know, there's this, this, this now this contradiction begins to build in is that, you know, here, here is all this white world and that's bad, but then here's some people who are the same color, but who have shown a great amount of, of, of love and acceptance and encouragement and so forth. And, you know, I just think as young people growing up, that's a lot to deal with. Mm -hmm. The mind is young and, and being, being developed. And when you have these kinds of things, which are really unnecessary. So I credit uh, our... Uh, uh, the, the forefathers of this country for not, not looking into the future <laughs> far enough to prevent all this stuff. Right, right. During your, your schooling then and into high school, did, was there any black history at all that was taught or? Um, None. No. Yeah. In fact, um, I can remember and as I used to go back to Pennsylvania on, on vacations and, and talk with my uh, the friends who I grew up with who went through school. <clears throat> and our black friends uh, used to laugh about this because the only thing that we saw interracially was um, slaves pictured and um, and and when that would happen, when they would show those pictures and everything, that these blacks in the cotton fields picking cotton and everything, we as blacks would scringe down in our seats and try to try to disappear from that. And uh, and then of course we found the humor in it at, as as we became adults and we would laugh about it. Uh, and then there was another example uh, of, of none history, none black history teaching. There was our music teacher there in the junior high school would always uh, somehow find the song Old Black Joe. And she would play that, it seems like every class that we had every day, she would play this thing and she would sit at the piano and we would all have to sing. Now remember, you know, you're, you're, you're the only black or maybe a couple in the class of, of all whites. And um, when you did that, you know, the black students, I guess, would just grab their chairs tightly and kind of get down and hope that they could just disappear and get through this. And again, as adults, we laugh about it. So no, we, I didn't learn anything about 
black history until I was, uh, until I uh, graduated uh, from college. And that's when I began on my own to read and learn about the history of black folks in America. So can you tell me a little bit about your journey toward college? Uh, you were an athlete in high school, mm -hmm. and that was part of what, what brought you to San Diego. Is that yes. Right? Yeah. Can you tell us that a little was bit so, about that? That was really what brought me to San Diego. And I started out as a, as a, as a basketball and baseball uh, player since elementary school. And uh, I was uh, uh, in high school, I became quite popular as a, as a sort of an accomplished athlete. I was uh, selected as the all-state basketball player uh, in my senior year and uh, uh, followed in my brother's footsteps because he had also achieved that as the first basketball player in the history of our school to achieve that mm. status of all state status and I was the second. So I was very popular in uh, as athletes are in, uh, in, in school, in high school, in junior high school and in high school. Um, when I was I was a ba baseball player, as I mentioned. In addition to basketball, I was too. I wasn't tall enough to to receive uh, any real attention to, to be recruited to these colleges and so forth. But two people who had attended San Diego State, older fellows who were in the Navy, and they had been to San Diego and actually ended up playing basketball for San Diego State. And as I came along in my senior year, they came, when they came home to York, they approached me and encouraged me to go there. Well, my counselors had already sort of programmed me to go to Penn State, which I did. Uh, and I attended Penn State on a on a uh, scholarship, on a basketball scholarship, <clears throat> which uh, I paid for my tuition, but that was about it. And uh, there was no money for, for, uh, uh, for uh, rent for, uh, to, or food or anything like that. So I eventually left there and uh, went to, uh, accepted a, uh, uh, a tryout with the St. Louis Browns in uh, in Thomasville, Georgia, uh, and I did that. And after a couple of injuries, I went back home to York and wrote the uh, coach at San Diego State and said that I was ready to come out there. And so I did that, and I came to San Diego and uh, and uh, was. Because I was a transfer, I was ineligible to play. I had to wait out a year. Mm -hmm. So the coach at San Diego State told me, said, how, what you should do, let's have you go to, to the junior college first and just, you know, you won't miss your education, but you won't be able to play at San Diego State, but you can play there and you won't, and it won't be counted against mm -hmm. your eligibility. And I said, oh, that sounds like a good plan. Well, it was not correct <laughs> because when I went there and signed up for the classes and so forth at the junior college, it did it would have counted. So I didn't play until uh, I got to San Diego State, and I was in, the, in between junior college and San and San Diego State. I was drafted into the army, and so I spent two years. In the uh, in the army, and then I went to uh, okay. San wow. Diego State. Right. <laughs> so did did you end up playing for the St. Louis Browns? No, well? no, uh -uh. no I did injuries. not. Yeah. I uh, one of the things that I talk about, uh, and I try to help with younger people, is making sure 
that they have someone in their lives who can uh, provide some guidance and, mm -hmm. and advice. Um, I grew up uh, with, uh, with a mother and some, some older uh, siblings, but there wasn't, there wasn't any, any person in my life other than in school. There wasn't any person to really provide this advice and guidance and so on and introduce me to things that I should be introduced to. So when I went to, uh, an example of this is when I went to, um, the, to the uh, minor league training camp for the St. Louis Browns, I went there not knowing that you are expected when you arrive to be in shape and ready mm. to play ball. Mm. Well, my experience was that, you know, in York, Pennsylvania, it was cold in the winter and you might get your glove and ball and start throwing a little bit in the gym uh, come April uh, <laughs> and do some running a little bit. So when I got there, I mean, boy, I was shocked. I mean, man, we were going full steam doing running uh, wind, wind sprints and throwing hard and fielding and all this stuff. And my arm couldn't mm -hmm. take it. My uh, legs couldn't take it. And so I was playing. I was shortstop, and I was trying to throw from short to first. And my needles and things just mm -hmm. fell like all mm -hmm. through my arms. So that was a bad try. I had mm -hmm. to go home, and, uh, and uh, then I just, you know, waited my time to, uh, for the next step, which mm -hmm. was my next step was, okay, let me get on back into college because mm -hmm. I wanted to play ball in college. And uh, that's what happened. I ended up at San Diego State. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, I want to ask about your military service, but just a question about racial dynamics on teams and in the locker room. Was that a different situation or more of the same? Can, can you tell us a little bit about yeah. what your experiences were there? I think sports is, a, is such a great opportunity to uh, address the racial issue. Mm. Uh, some of the friends that I really got, got to have growing up were through sports. And maybe there were a couple or so other white students who uh, I got to be friends with. But the ones I really got to know and have some association with beyond the school boundaries was with those teammates. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, all through through junior high school, that was true. And uh, of course you have your, the blacks who made the team, of course, we all lived in the same neighborhoods or close by and we knew each other, we saw each other uh, after school and we had a separate facility, a separate recreational facility called Christmas Addicts uh, Center, community center, that we blacks went to and so, we were together, but re getting uh, uh, relationships with your your white uh, classmates and so forth is really hard. And if it were not for the the sports program, I mean, it probably just wouldn't would hardly happen at all. And that all went through 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 junior high school. Uh, in high school, it was it was even. Uh, um, more difficult to to have relationships with the white students, even the the, uh, the schoolmates, even your your teammates, because they came from different parts of the county, and uh, you saw them, you played, and that was it. And it wasn't like you were going over to each other's houses. No, yeah. Yeah. no, nothing like that. You didn't get to really know them, and they didn't get to know you. 
and then as in college, playing ball in college, it was the same thing. I mean, we had, you have very few blacks on the team, mm -hmm. uh, and the white players you saw uh, at practice and uh, maybe in the cafeteria once in a while, uh, and that was it. The black players, you know, we were together after the practice, during the evenings, on the weekends sometimes, you know. And so while sports offered a great opportunity, uh, there still left a lot to be desired. And uh, I... I I regret that uh, more was, was not done, mm -hmm. you know, during that period when I was an athlete. As you were saying before, that uh, you did go out to San Diego and then um, went for the year of junior college, and then, uh, then the military came calling. Can you <laughs> yes. tell us about that? Well, uh, when I went back, uh, when I left... Uh, San Diego, when I left school after junior college for the summer, I re went back to uh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and what year was that? That was um, uh, 1953. Okay. And I, so when I went back to, to York, I inquired about, because I didn't want to make a trip back to California and then get drafted and then have to return back to Pennsylvania uh, and be inducted from uh, Pennsylvania. So I inquired when I was in York about my status, my draft status, and uh, the person told me, oh, you're, uh, you're right close to being drafted. And whether that was true or not, <laughs> I'm not so sure, but... Uh, <laughs> I said, well, I might as well get it over with, go in now and get my two years over with. So that's what I did. And I. Um, and this uh, is right at the end of the Korean War was winding yes, down. Yes, right at the end of the Korean War. And uh, I was, uh, I did my, uh, my uh, training in, uh, in uh, Georgia. Uh, uh, I was going to say Thomasville, I get mixed up with my baseball, but it was with uh, Camp Gordon, Georgia. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what was the situation like there at that time? Well, as long as you stayed on the base, things were okay, mostly. I mean, it wasn't like there was any, you, you could mix with males, but there wasn't any mixing with females as a black person. Now, the movies, your, uh, uh, the mess hall and so forth where you ate and all that was, uh, was, uh, was fine. There was no and problem. And the barracks? As long as you stayed on the post. Mm -hmm. but when you went off post in the town, that's when you ran into trouble. And that's where I saw uh, signs uh, on at uh, as we would be walking down the street, you'd see signs saying no, no, uh, no Jews or niggers allowed, no dogs, Jews or niggers allowed, and you'd see that kind of stuff, you know. And so, of course, we limited our uh, contact. <laughs> we just didn't go in into town very much. And that, that was my basic training. And then I was uh, uh, then sent to, uh, to New Jersey at Fort Monmouth, where that was my permanent uh, station there. Okay. And how were things in New Jersey? New Jersey was fine. Uh, we, uh, we could go to after hours we would go out in uh, in the town a little bit and go out to the uh to a bar and and guys would have some drinks and so forth but and we never i never experienced any problems there except for one uh, i received an assignment to 
go to uh, Louisiana on an operation, it was called Operation Sagebrush. And so I was assigned to that and we were going to, and I mean, what I knew at this point in my life about uh, racism in America, I was not going there. And so I, in my naivete, decided I was going to the post commander and tell him I'm not going down there. <laughs> and uh, here I am, just an enlist, enlisted man. I'm not an officer, I'm an enlisted man. Even an officer wouldn't do that. Uh, so I requested, well, I went over and just uh, asked to, to see and talk with him. And he invited me in, and I told him, I said, you know, as a Negro, uh, it just doesn't make any sense for me uh, to go to a place where I'm not wanted and to have to go to the South and, and uh, be exposed to those conditions. I'm sure I didn't say it in these words. I was a young, shy kid who, who was just upset and because... And, and afraid, I, I guess. Uh, so he looked at me and um, he listened and he said uh, something. Uh, okay, uh, you know, return, return to your uh, to your barracks. And so uh, I returned to my barracks and we received orders to sh ship out and uh, I was among those who shipped out uh, along with all the others and we were shipped down to uh, uh, Louisiana and lived in the, in the, in the bushes in the outskirts of the, of the towns. And uh, that was, you know, we just stayed out there and um, going in town, I, I think only went in town one time to Shreveport and uh, didn't experience anything, but mm. I certainly didn't, didn't notice any integration or anything like that. Right. And we did our time down there and, uh, and shipped back to uh, uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Mm. So you're, you did your two years and then back to San Diego? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> and uh, San Diego State was, uh, was a good experience, but at the same time, you know, it's, 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 it's just been one incident after another that uh, spoke to you as a descendant of slaves, as a black person, as a Negro, as a colored person, you know, it just kept coming incident after incident in, 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 in a reminder form that you are not a first class citizen in this country. Mm -hmm. And so my experience at San Diego State, one thing that stands out is that I, uh, I, while I was uh, an athlete, I was also interested in, in, in student government and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was encouraged to run for an office uh, in student government. I did. I won and sat on the council, student council. And on that council, I was asked to uh, chair a certain committee. It was called the Constitution's Committee. And that committee was responsible for reviewing the, uh, uh, the constitutions and charters of all the uh, on-campus uh, organizations, all the sororities, all the fraternities, mm -hmm. and so on. So when I started reviewing these, I saw in the charters of the 
of the fraternities, and white fraternities and sororities, that uh, it was for white male or mm -hmm. white female. And, you know, in good conscience, I couldn't approve that. And so I didn't approve them. And, of course, my recommendation was to be made to the, to the council, and then the council would, uh, would vote on it. Well, of course, when I didn't approve them, that meant they would not get, uh, not mm -hmm. receive on-campus status and all the privileges thereof. And so, of course, I was called in by the dean <laughs> of students, and we had a chat about it and so forth. And I never found out what actually happened, uh, uh, whether or not, you know, these people really, these organizations really received on-campus status or probationary status for some reason. And I didn't push it mm. beyond that. Uh, and that was my experience that really stood out at San Diego State, along with the... Uh, the friendship and the the uh, the real guidance and love that I received from some of the faculty members at that time. So again, there was a sort of a balancing of mm -hmm. the the, the um, uh, I think there were about twenty five black students in the whole university at that time, and out of a out of an enrollment, I think it must have been around 11,000, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And here again, you know, you're, you sit in the classrooms, you're the only black student, uh, and it's the same thing over again, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't run into any, it wasn't that you were some great incidents, but Still, I mean, that's, you know, the, the, um, the, the Black Studies program was created in this country uh, in part to provide some uh, companionship for those of that ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And although there was a lot, there was a lot of, uh, of uh, pushback on that, but, you know, it's, a, it's you're young. Mm -hmm. You want companionship and friendship, totally. and you need that to grow and so on. And all students need that. But when you sit there in a, in a, in a land of uh, what you know to be racist uh, uh, towards you, and when you walk down uh, a street and you're called nigger, you're right there in San Diego, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, that's your life, mm -hmm. and uh, you end up, you know, I guess, with some, some, some feelings. What mm -hmm. those feelings happen to be depends on the individual. For me, it was anger. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was angry, and I knew that I had to do something about it. I was maturing. I wasn't in junior high school and I wasn't in high school age. I had been around a little bit and I matured and the, 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 the further I went the more angry I got and so that's how I decided at, uh, when I graduated from San Diego State to join the Civil Rights Movement. You had a very small African American community, obviously at at the school. What about within the the city of San Diego? Yeah, it was always around six <clears throat> percent. And uh, as I recall, when we were uh, when we had formed the the Congress for Racial Equality here in San Diego, uh, I recall that the, the number of blacks in San Diego was, I think, somewhere around 60,000. Um, and I, I, I don't know what the uh, San Diego population was, but that number of 60,000 seemed, it was, well, it was around 6%, as I recall. Mm -hmm. 
And so you, you graduated and, but stayed in the city. What else yes. did you do? And you said, I, I want to hear the story of you turning to the Civil Rights Movement, but, but what, what did you do post-graduation? Well, I did uh, postgraduate work here at San Diego State in speech pathology. And, uh, and I was waiting to see if I could get a job teaching school. Now, here's another thing about uh, where this guidance and counseling for young people is so necessary. I, I, in, when I was in junior high school, and especially in high school, uh, I wanted to be a physical education teacher and a coach. That's what I knew, and there's, that's where I felt comfortable, and that's what I did best. <laughs> I liked school, and I was good in school, but I excelled in that area. So when I went to San Diego State, I accomplished that. You know, my major was in physical education. And, uh, and my minor was in speech correction or the speech pathology area. And, but I wanted to be a coach. Now, when, after I graduated, I'm waiting around for a job, and it occurs to me, wait a minute, they don't hire blacks to coach in high schools? Now here I am, you know, I mean, all these years, I mean, I mean, it looks like I, <laughs> I would have realized, I would have put two and two together or <laughs> through those years. But for some reason, when I came to San Diego, I graduated from San Diego State, I thought, okay, I, you know, I'm okay, going toward my goal. I'll be a coach. But then, bong hit <laughs> me, they don't hire you. And so I tried to get a job just teaching uh, physical education on the junior high level mm -hmm. or, or, or even on the high school level. Uh, so when I applied for a position, not in this, the city of San Diego, but this was in the city of La Mesa. Mm -hmm. And I applied, and they said the only way they could hire me, and I think this guy was the prince was the superintendent. He said the only way he could hire me is if, if if they um, polled all the teachers in the district to see if it would be okay to hire a Negro. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, forget that, <laughs> and. Uh, I just decided that um, I was uh, approached by, uh, there, there was a, an organization that was, that was starting called the El Cajon Valley Open Housing Committee. And they formed to, for the purpose of, of, of um, integrating the neighborhoods uh, in La Mesa in El Cajon, just east of San Diego State. And so uh, I joined with them. This was an all-white group. Mm. I joined with them, and, um, and then uh, about a year into that, or so I was approached by a black fellow uh, who happened to be at one of those meetings that we held, <clears throat> and he said that they were forming a chapter of core in San Diego, and would I join with them? And then I, that's, I did, and I think that was 1960. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that started my career in core in that year. And I was, a, but I did get a job teaching school. Uh, uh, I was, I, re, I, re, I received this position uh, as a result of one of my schoolmates at San Diego State who knew me and uh, I think we were maybe in a 
class together and so on. He knew me and they were looking for a teacher there where he was teaching and he recommended uh, to the uh, principal, recommended me. And so uh, they got in touch with me and brought me out for an interview. In the meantime, I had no idea whether I was going to get a job. I mean, I was kind of sweating it out. We were getting, you know, close to September, and, and I didn't have a job. So I uh, talked with the principal and everything, and they hired me, and I had a great time teaching there uh, for five years and before I uh, uh, went into the Peace Corps. I was invited to, into the Peace Corps to, uh, to apply for a position as deputy director, which I did, <clears throat> in, um, and then was assigned to um, Lesotho, South Africa, Southern Africa. Mm-hmm. So with the Congress of Racial Equality, did you know much about them already before you heard about the San Diego chapter? No, I knew nothing about right. CORE mm-hmm. until, uh, until uh, I, there was a meeting to uh, organize it. <clears throat> and uh, I decided, because this was my first year of teaching, that I better cool it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and something told me, look, don't do that your first year. Let them see what you can do as a teacher, you know. And uh, once you get a year under your belt, mm-hmm. then you can, you know, pursue your activities in the civil rights movement. So that's what I did. And uh, uh, fortunately, I was selected as one of the five outstanding t- uh, uh, new teachers mm-hmm. in San Diego. So I had that under my belt. And then I decided, okay, you know, I'll uh, go. And then I became the uh, chairman uh, of uh, the San Diego Corps. And uh, we Straight went, to chairman. Well, yes. You didn't, you didn't mess around. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, did you, so this is around 1960, mm-hmm. correct? That was about 61. 61, uh-huh. okay. So were you, where, where were you? In, um, in, say, 1955, when the Montgomery bus boycott was going on? I was, um, I had just separated, uh, no, I was in the, I was still in the uh, Army. I went in in 54, and I was separated from the Army in 56. Okay. So I was at Fort Monmouth then. Mm-hmm. And would you have... Watching television. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, would you have gotten newspapers or even black newspapers? Were they allowed on base? I know sometimes they weren't. Mm. Um, that, were, were you following the news? I was following the news through television, but uh, never saw a newspaper <clears throat> while I was at Fort Monmouth. Uh, and then I would get weekend passes once in a while and so I'd go to York and uh, visit my family and of course the papers and the news there but I was I watched on TV you know uh, all the civil rights activities that were going on and some basketball (laughs) (laughs) okay so I just wanted to ask that question. So, sure. so back to, to CORE then, can you tell me about what that was like, organizing yeah. the chapter and, and what you all um, recognized as the major challenges in the city and what you wanted to focus yes. on? Yes. Well, we had a person who I think he was affiliated with National CORE in some way, and he helped us form the... Um, uh, the San Diego chapter, and um, and I remember we met and you know we wrote up the bylaws, et cetera, et cetera, and formed a 501c uh, three organization. Uh, then, uh, as we as we met, and and I think we were 
meeting pretty regularly then. Uh, we had elections and so forth, and, and they had asked me if I would run for the position of chairman, and which I did. And uh, there was some problems th there because prior to that, I had also become uh, a member of an organization uh, which was known as the Black Nationalist Organization. It was the Afro-American Association. Now, it was labeled, I think, a, a Black Nationalist Organization. That's what the media and that's what they called us, a Black Nationalist. I didn't know what that was at first. Uh, so what the purpose of that organization was and it's, it's, it's still there's a need today. We, we, f we formed it to educate black people about the plight of black people in America, mm -hmm. teaching black history and having discussions and so forth about the conditions of black folk in America. And so that was that was a nice experience, a very good experience. And uh, so this connects back to when I asked you earlier if you had had Black History yes, before in school, and you yes, hadn't. So yes. this is a program of self-education. Yes, absolutely. And my in first introduction to uh, many of the books that I have in my library now and discussions and so forth, and I reached a point where I remember, I think the first one I read was Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett, and, uh, and I had discussions with some young people about uh, our history. And so then, uh, you know, when I ran for the position of chair, I became the chairman, and the conditions were deplorable as we found them here in San Diego. Uh, not only were, were there segregated schools, but as I recall, there were 19 schools in, in San Diego that were segregated. And uh, we've, we found that to be uh, serious, but we found employment discrimination to be really our top priority. And so we worked on, on uh, the businesses, the companies around San Diego to try to open up these companies uh, to hire blacks. Now, blacks could not be hired in the grocery stores. These chain stores and everything, they didn't hire blacks, even as... Uh, as uh, uh, what do you call those, those uh, baggers. baggers, yes, much less than other positions of mm -hmm. cashier and management and everything. You couldn't even be hired as a bagger. And, uh, and, and there were no freeways back then, so the downtown, uh, there were no blacks who worked in the downtown. Just prior to, to some years before I started, in, in core, they had had some demonstration against, I think it was Woolworths down there because he couldn't sit, he couldn't eat in, in Woolworths. And uh, it was led by uh, a black dentist, uh, uh, Dr. Kimbrough, who, who, Dr. Jack Kimbrough. And so, uh, you know, the conditions were, I mean, you couldn't rent, you couldn't, you couldn't live, you couldn't rent or buy a house or apartment outside of what was called Logan Heights, was where blacks were, were uh, forced to live. Logan Heights and, and, and now it, it's known as uh, Southeastern, Southeastern San Diego. So you had to live in that area. And then and I, I talk about an example of that is when uh, the uh, young lady that I married in 1967, she, she came to San Diego. She was recruited 
to San Diego. Can we take a... You were, we were just starting to talk about um, the woman that, who you married. Oh, marry. yes, yeah, yes. So in 1967. She, she was recruited to come to San Diego uh, with General Dynamics. She was a, as a math major who graduated from uh, Alabama State University. She came, she was, she was living in uh, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio at the time. She was recruited to come to San Diego to work for General Dynamics as a systems programmer, mm -hmm. computer programmer. And so uh, she accepted and she came here and uh, couldn't find a place to live. Uh, she, would, she, was, she was given a list by General Dynamics of places to, you know, apartments and houses and so forth that she could go. And, well, she would call those places. And uh, when she would get there, they would say they have a vacancy, of course. And then when you got there and they saw who she was, they said, we don't rent the Negroes. And uh, so that was it. She had to go on to the next place. And so she went there. She couldn't find a place to live. And uh, even though she would call and say they had a place, but when she got there, they didn't have one. They had just rented it or something. So... But she was, um, uh, she had to stay in the Y until she could find a place to live. And I met her because I was planning to go into business and I was going to leave teaching and I went to sell uh, new automobiles to kind of get into the mm -hmm. field and business. And I, when I went in there, she was buying a car to try, so she could get back and forth to work. The, the sales guy introduced us and asked if I would show her where General Dynamics was. And she had only been in San Diego over a day or two. And uh, so I said, yes. Well, she complained when she went back. She complained to the cleaning lady who was black at the Y. And this... And she was saying, well, you know, she can find a place to live and blah, blah, blah. And so the sales lady said, honey, what you should do, there's a man in town you should call. You call Hal Brown. And, he <laughs> and so she said, that's, you know, that sounded familiar. <laughs> so anyhow, that's how it's, I met her and, and I started showing her around to find a place to live. And finally, um, she was, I, I had a, uh, I was acquainted with an apartment where one of my uh, fellow teachers uh, lived. She, she uh, we had had a, a little party or something over to her house and I remembered that and I thought that was a nice apartment. So I said, this would be a nice place for you to live. Showed her that, and uh, she said, oh, yeah, it looks nice. It had a pool there. And um, so she went in to talk to the manager, and the manager said, uh, well, uh, uh, she called first, and he said he had, a, he had an opening. And when she went by there, and he, then he said, no, he said, well, we, uh, we just can't rent to Negroes. And so she said, uh, well, uh, why? She said, well, the owner who lives in Canada, I think he said, um, doesn't want us to, to uh, rent to Negroes. So I was with her, and I was sitting over there while she was talking with him. And then I got up, and I said, I don't believe that. And he looked at me and said, well, that's what it is. I said, no, I don't believe that. I said, here's what I'll do. I'll go around. You and I will go around to each apartment, and we'll knock on the door, and we'll ask that hmm. tenant whether or not they would uh, mind or object to living next to a person who is a Negro. I had a little thing on my sleeve. I was going to go to the to my friend's <laughs> place first <laughs> in her apartment. And, uh, but he wouldn't do that. He, wouldn't. he said, oh, no, no, he wouldn't do it. So he said, I'll see what, we, what, can happen, what we can do. Well, we left. She called back 
I guess the, it was the next day or so, and he said, no, he said, uh, the owner in Canada just doesn't want to rent to a Negro. And so I said, well, you know, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to round up a hundred of my black friends and we're coming over to your apartment building and we're going to take off our clothes, we'll have our bathing suits on and we're all going to get in that pool. <laughs> he said, oh, no, uh, no, I tell you what, I think we can... <laughs> I think we can rent, let her rent, a, rent the apartment. <laughs> and that's how she got the apartment. I had to threaten them with that. And I guess that imagery was just hmm. too much to see uh, all these black folks. And then all of his, uh, uh, those people that he was referring to about moving out, I guess they, he visualized they would uh, all be gone if we did that. So. Anyhow, that's how she finally got to move in. So discrimination in housing was, was, was terrible. There were covenants, of course, uh, in, um, in places, in, in all the places, in the homes and things where the people couldn't, couldn't sell their home to a black person. And so we had a lot of demonstrations against the... Uh, uh, the the uh, California Real Estate Association, and then we, of course, we picketed uh, uh, and had sit-ins at various places of trying to get jobs for for uh, blacks back in those years. And it, and our biggest uh, project was against the Bank of America, uh, which that's where. Uh, I received my jail sentences from the Bank of America demonstrations and also from the San Diego Gas and Electric uh, demonstrations. So, and what were, the, what were the goals there, especially with Bank of America? Well, we wanted them to open their employment to Negroes mm -hmm. back in those years. And we same thing for the San Diego Gas and Electric Company. So at that time, I was chairman of the Western Region of CORE. Mm -hmm. And so the, we had, uh, they had decided that we would have a, a, a movement, um, a demonstration, and we would take action against Bank of America throughout the state of California. And that's what we did. What did, did the Western did. Region cover? All the, all the um, uh, uh, states uh, from, uh, I think we even included Colorado, hmm. but uh, in California and Oregon and um, um, Washington. So you had really risen Utah. up in, in national, national court. Yeah, yeah, I was on the, um, on the um, uh, what we called the uh, advisory uh, Council, National Advisory Council. Uh, that's where, you know, Jim Farmer and, and, and I became friends and Floyd McKissick and, and I became friends and uh, we, we, uh, we had quite a, quite a project against the Bank of America and, and uh, we the results were so good. I mean, although the Bank of America would never admit it, but uh, I mean, we forced the Bank of America and the San Diego Gas and Electric Company to start hiring mm -hmm. Negroes, and 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 they did. I mean, and and the they would not come to me, talk with me directly, mm -hmm. but they would talk to one of the ministers in the community about, you know, could they find some Negroes to come down and apply for mm -hmm. the jobs and everything. So the minister and I were friends. <laughs> so that's how I, mean, I got to know that. And, uh, but they did. They hired, and I argued in court 
uh, that was that my de our defense was that you know if you look at the results, mm. uh, but of course, the prosecutor I and mean, the law is the law. You broke the law. And they got us for trespassing, okay. and uh, so you broke the law. And for a at a protest, or yeah. What were, so what were the strategies that you used? We we did uh, uh, we had marches, mm -hmm. uh, and we had uh, sit-ins. Uh, we had coin ins. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, uh, with the SDG and E. We had mail ins where we would mail in, uh, all, uh, get people to mail in short of their uh, their due, their mm -hmm. balance due uh, for the month. We would send either either over or under, and uh, uh, just kind of. A nuisance factor, <laughs> right. but uh, it was it was effective. And uh, what the, was the coin in? The coin in was we would we would stand in line at the teller's uh, window, mm. and uh, we would uh, have a lot of pennies with us, and we would we would either ask for pennies. Uh, we would give them a ten dollars, and we would ask for some change. And, they, and when we would stand there and count all the pennies, or we would bring pennies with us. And uh, when we got to the front of the window, we would make our deposit or whatever we do, and we count out the one pennies at one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, while the others were sitting on the floor. Singing our uh, our songs and things, and and uh, that was, you know, that was very effective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it created some real results. I mean, you look at those banks and things now, and of course, I always point out. I mean, I'm not saying that you know take San Diego Core you take full credit for for that, but uh, there was a national movement going on. Mm -hmm. And in that context, I mean, you know, we were able to be very effective. And we laid it on the line. We laid our, our jobs on the line. And uh, I was, uh, I was uh, called to appear... Uh, in Sacramento, at the board of, um, uh, I guess it was the board of trustees who was over the education, uh, the state superintendent and so forth, and I was called uh, to come there to, to explain why I should not have my teaching credential removed from, because of my leadership in, the, in core. So, you know, I had a lawyer who was in core as well, and he went with me up to go to defend myself. And uh, I don't know if it was just a scare tactic or they couldn't, didn't want to pursue it, but they didn't take my credential. Uh, but that was... That was sort of a scary time. <laughs> yeah. It's still, it's, that's intimidation. That's, a, yeah. that's yeah. A really intimidation, yeah. is yeah. right. But uh, that was, um, you know, we, 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 we did well. We served our jail times. Um, we were able to, sell, to serve our jail times on weekends. Mm. And uh, so that, you know, helped. What, I mean, I was still teaching school, right. and yeah. uh, <laughs> it's my wife. I was teaching school, and uh, they said, "Well, you know, you can serve his time on weekends," which mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. But there was only really effective uh, times back mm -hmm. then. Now, was the the core effort in this area largely African American? Was it an interracial? That's a good question, and I always point out to people that during those years, uh, there were more white members than there were black members. 
there were blacks and whites, and the whites were probably two thirds of the of the chapter, and I can remember going out strongly trying to recruit blacks to to uh, become uh, uh, members of core just to, to participate in some way with core I mean you know our membership dues was twenty five dollars mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, everyone could afford it but we could not there were those were the times where blacks did were uh, in my opinion were very much afraid to be involved in uh, the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have many. It took a lot of work to try to get them uh, involved. I mean, even at our national meetings, I mean, we would discuss that a lot. And at our national convention, we had a big thing about trying to get more mm -hmm. blacks involved. And so I spent a lot of time in uh, on trying to do that, uh, but that was that was tough. Blacks did not uh, did not participate in the civil rights movement here in San Diego to any degree. What, why do you think that was? Well, I think it's because uh, they were fearful of reprisals. I mean, I just they did not want to risk whatever they had. Of course. Our comeback was, well, you, you don't have very much to begin with, mm -hmm. but whatever they had, they just did not want to risk that. And there were comments that would come back to me a lot, some about, you know, that I, I never would be able to keep my job mm -hmm. because they would find a way to fire me and so forth, which there was some attempt, I guess, but. So I mean, they just did not want to risk that, even to the point where they would even um, uh, admit to their white friends that they even knew me, I mean, friends of mine. And so, you know, it was pretty bad back in, in those days. Whatever they had, they didn't want to risk losing it. What? what? If you know, what, did the, what were the historic origins of the, the black community here? Where did people come from? Was it mostly the port or working mm -hmm. uh, or war industry? What, what brought people? I understand to that a uh, number came through the Navy mm -hmm. and uh, some, a lot, it seemed, uh, had no. I don't know of any surveys or any, any research done in this area, but it, it, it seemed from talking with people that, you know, a number of people came from Texas area. Uh, but my understanding is, is they were introduced to San Diego through the Navy. Mm -hmm. Some people got here, I don't know how, out there in a place called Ramona up there, that there were Negroes that settled there. Mm -hmm. uh, Back, I don't know when that was. It was probably either the very early 1900s or late 1800s. Another thing I was going to ask you about, because I was asking about sort of the interracial organization, but there's already a large uh, Latino population in San Diego at that time. No. No. There was not a large Latino population. Mm -mm. Okay. No. In fact, uh, now I don't. I don't know the the stats on on it, but uh, over in Southeast San Diego, that was known as a black community, and there were very few Latinos living there. Now I think it's two thirds Latino. Mm -hmm. uh, no, there just weren't very many. Uh, the Mexican population was evidently very small mm -hmm. back then because okay. they certainly weren't visible. Okay, so that came later. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another thing I wanted to ask about was um, other civil rights organizations. So you're you're here with CORE, 
but we're talking about early 60s when you have the, the student uh, sit-in movement happening in other places, mm -hmm. uh, freedom rides, etc. Right. Um, were there other organizations that came into this area or that you were in contact with and worked with or that you were paying attention to from afar? The only organizations were uh, the NAACP, mm -hmm. the Urban League, mm -hmm. uh, those were the only other organizations. And, and the NAACP at that time was practically in, invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, they had no participation with us in the civil rights movement at, in San Diego. And the Urban League was... Uh, had no participation with us in the civil rights movement, but they they were here. They were present. You could contact them. The NAACP, and I say, you know, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, I tried to find them and join them, and end up, honestly, I did, and I just I couldn't. I mean, the, the, wherever they were supposed to have an office, it wasn't open, and and got the call and couldn't contact them, and. And I tried and tried, but, well, the only organization other than CORE was, as I mentioned earlier, the um, Afro-American Association. And did that continue, or did that also fade out? That faded out. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I became so involved right. in CORE. In, uh, and uh, I don't know really what happened to it, but it kind of just faded. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep us going with your uh, involvement with CORE, um, so we're sort of in the early 60s now, can mm -hmm. so you just take us forward? Well, um, one of the things that I did not mention, which I'm going to try to write about, include this part of it, is in um, what people didn't actually realize about CORE. It was, CORE was, was uh, an organization that had internal problems, too. And so, I mean, I was in a position where I was not only fighting uh, white racism on the outside, but I was fighting uh, opposition from the inside, and uh, that opposition was in in the form of uh, that I really don't know. I mean, it, people. It was it was rumored and uh, by by private citizens as well as the FBI. I mean that we had the same problem as other chapters throughout the country had with uh, infiltration of uh, other groups. Uh, I only know that the, the peace movement was the only group that I knew was, uh, was wanted to become active in our organization and to exert some influence on what we did. Uh, and I refused that because I was very myopic in my view that we had, uh, you know, we had enough on our plate in our minds to try to conquer this racial problem against Negroes in America. You know, and we had enough to do with that, mm -hmm. and I was not interested in in. Uh, trying to use my personal resources and energy to take on some other battles like the peace movement and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, the other issue was uh, communism and Trotskyitism. And, and I didn't even know what the Trotskyite was <laughs> and the communist either. The first I heard about communism, communism was in high school and in, in history books. And, but I knew nothing about it. So while they tried to accuse us of being communists, I mean, I didn't even know what they were talking about. But anyhow, that was 
a way of labeling us, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. core and other organizations that uh, you're, you've been infiltrated by the communism and so on. But there was a battle. Uh, I couldn't identify it. I couldn't label it with any particular name, but there was a tremendous battle inside our organization to oust me and, uh, and uh, uh, take over, you know, the leadership with another person and another group. And so those were some really, really, really tumultuous times and uh, quite uh, painful. Mm -hmm. Uh, more painful, I would say, than the the, the fight against mm -hmm. the companies that were segregating, were, were were discriminating in employment and the housing and all that stuff. You know, it was more painful mm -hmm. because it came from it came from the people inside the organization, both blacks and whites. Mm -hmm. And what was the result of those struggles? Well, I've never been asked that question because uh, the truth would be that the results of that constant um, uh, fighting, I, just, I can't think of a better word, fighting was that I finally left. And uh, it was at the end of... of you know, my it was my jail sentences. What I was doing them and all that, and and after that, I uh, resigned and and left. And core just kind of. So after you left, it really by. just yeah. evaporated. Yeah. And when when was that, approximately? Uh, I think it was '67. Hmm. And I think there was an attempt by. By a friend of mine to uh, to take to take over the leadership, but then you know, and then when we left and went to D.C. for uh, preparing to go over over into Africa, Peace right. Corps. Uh, my understanding was is that the um, the um, Oh, the uh, black, the, the uh, I can't, well, I'm, I'm going blank, the black power movement of... Uh, the Black Panthers? Black or? Panthers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Black Panther movement and, and the US movement. Right. You remember the US movement? There was a problem in San Diego, and I was gone, so all this is hearsay. There is a lot of infighting between those two organizations mm -hmm. and so on, and so. Uh, and that really came in after you left. Yeah, so you, weren't, you weren't here to yeah, see. Yeah, I wasn't here. To, even arrive. No, okay. I wasn't yeah. here, and so core just kind of, I guess, faded away. And then a sort of, another wave came in behind it. Yeah, know? and that yeah. was, pretty temporary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a lot of fighting and stuff that went on, and uh, but. I don't think there was any real hmm. anyone had really grabbed onto the issues and pursued those issues or tried to replace core or mm -hmm. anything. They just I don't know. I don't really understand it now. I don't know just what happened, but it just seemed to fade away. Mm -hmm. Us and uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, Black Panthers, mm -hmm. at least in San Diego. At least in San Diego, right, mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah. So then you were in Lesotho for a couple of years? No, I was there for one, one year, year, just okay. a little under a year. Okay. That's another story in itself in that uh, uh, <laughs> I always find, because of the way I grew up and the family I grew up, I always find humor in a lot of these tragedies. Uh, but when we went there, uh, Lesotho is a country that's completely surrounded by South Africa. And so getting in and out, you had to go to, through 
South Africa. So when my wife and I uh, went to Les over to Lesotho, we had to stop in Johannesburg. And so we were, wait we were waiting for the uh, flight to take us to Lesotho the next morning. And um, so, of course, I mean, apartheid was very strong then. So what they did was they had some a room that was above the uh, airport somewhere, and that was that was for blacks. Could but that but you had to stay in that room. You couldn't be in the airport anywhere. You had to stay in that room until your flight left. Now these were for Africans and. I was African then, you know. I mean, it was the first time I was considered African. Well, they put us up there in that room, and uh, we stayed there. So I, I decided the next morning that I was going to test it and just get out and walk around the airport to see. And uh, I did that, and the next thing I heard was over the, over the uh, PA system that, uh, you know, Harold Brown, uh, report to such and such and such, and um, my wife saw the uh, some guys coming and uh, and chatting, standing around, chatting, chatting, and she was getting worried because her fool husband was out there going, you know, <laughs> probably get jailed and so forth in South Africa. But anyhow. Uh, one guy came up to me, and I suspect that it, he was from the uh, United States Embassy. He came up to me and it was kind of stood and looked the other way and, and whispered and said, uh, is everything all right? Is, every, you know, is, there, is everything okay? Is everything all right? And I looked <laughs> and said, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's okay. So yeah. we finally got, they got me back and the plane came and we're off to Lesotho. And so now we are land in Lesotho. There's a, a black prime minister and so on. And uh, we landed and the people seemed to be pretty joyous, you know. My wife and I, two African Americans, two, two, two blacks. Uh, I mean, they, they, blacks to them, we were African, you know, I mean, they didn't, that's a term we use in America, blacks. We were Africans. So we turned in, they seemed to be, you know, greeted us well, was all, everything was really nice. And then, uh, sometime later, maybe a month or so later, the Peace Corps volunteers came. And so, they land in the airport and then coming out of those planes are all these white stu mm. <laughs> students, you know, and it was, was really funny because I could imagine how those, how the, the Basutu, uh, felt they were in shock because they saw us and they didn't know anything about the Peace Corps. They thought, oh, oh the this Peace Corps, you know, <laughs> this Peace Corps in their mind was black and they saw all those whites and then we had about I think three blacks, Peace Corps workers. So they came off, and then, of course, it was a, the war was on. That uh, we were, the Peace Corps was accused of uh, of uh, all kinds of things, you mm -hmm. know, and spying on uh, on Lesotho, and it just went on and on for that time and then while we were while we were there course, and you were one of the directors of the the program in, in yeah, Lusitu, yeah right? i was a deputy deputy director deputy director so you, were you being called in to answer to these things or having no. to handle pr or no, no. we no. had a charge of affairs yeah. and not an ambassador a charge of affairs but uh no he never consulted me but uh I was invited to speak to by different people in Maseru, mm -hmm. 
it's just at the Capitol to speak to their schools and so forth. And there's this Negro Americans here, you know, which they've never seen before. Right. <clears throat> and I did, and they would ask me about uh, about uh, uh, what, what they call us about, I guess, Africans in America, blacks in America, and. And I would tell them, you know, and they had, they were pretty sophisticated, uh, many of them. They knew what was going on around the country, and they would ask all these questions mm -hmm. about how we were treated in America. And I'd tell them, you know, the truth, just like I'm answering questions here. I would tell them, well, evidently, you know, they got back to the Chargé Affairs and his people, and they didn't like that because um, I was exposing America, I guess, you know, and that's still the problem we have today. I mean, that's why we're doing history right now, to try to get America to, to know and understand uh, what happened and uh, what's happening now. And I go to the, to the third step in my, in my writings, what should happen in the future. But that was the situation in, in Lesotho, and finally, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and that was just too much for me to to bear. I, I couldn't remain there, out of the country, and while all this was going on back home. And so, I told my wife to get packed because uh, I've got to go back. And so I did, and we we left. And I guess the Chargé Affair and were very happy about that. <laughs> So we came back and... Um, so had news reached you of, of what the response was in various cities to... to yeah, yeah, yes, uh -huh. yeah, what was going on. And, uh, and uh, what, when, when Martin Luther King was, uh, was killed, I uh, went to the uh, church, to the uh, 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 AME church, African Methodist Episcopal Church there in Lesotho. Mm -hmm. And I asked if we could have a memorial service there uh, for uh, Martin. And uh, he said, oh yeah, of course. And so we put together a really nice memorial service in honor of Martin. And, and uh, uh, at the whole time we were there and before we got there, the king of Lesotho was um, uh, under house arrest because he opposed uh, our apartheid. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they, the people were able to put in a prime minister who, whether he agreed with apartheid or not, he went along with apartheid. Mm -hmm. But the king was sort of imprisoned, you know. And so when we had this church memorial service, who walks in? The king. Uh, it almost brings tears to my eyes now. Yeah, he walked in and uh, sat and, and through the whole service. Uh, and uh, I, gave, I gave the... Uh, the remarks and so forth with an interpreter and my wife sang a hymn and then we had some talks by uh, some of the Basutu leaders and uh, it was just a beautiful, uh, beautiful ceremony but when the king came in, you know, the, the, there, there's, there's in South Africa they, you probably have heard this, um, the ladies give a kind of a shrilling, mm -hmm. what, they go, yeah. Yeah, 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 uh huh. Yeah. It's just yeah. you know a sound that, right. yeah. but it's high and it's a, yeah. and so um, you know when he came in, it was just that. I mean, you know that it's just. We had been invited to to his palace a couple times, my wife and I, but uh, 
But when he walked in there, boy, it was really something. So after that, and then, you know, we were, got packed and everything. And I came back to the States and went through the uh, out-processing of the Peace Corps. Ended up uh, trying to get back to San Diego, and I couldn't find a position. So um, that's where Floyd McKissick and I started this company uh, in Harlem, uh, Floyd McKissick Enterprises. And so I worked there for, I don't know, less, less than a year, and then I moved to the, uh, to the, to the bank and I worked for Marine Midland Bank. For which bank, I'm sorry? Marine Midland, okay. M-I-D-L-A-N-D, <clears throat> on Wall Street. And uh, we did that, and then from there, I was asked to come back by an old friend of mine who had been exposed to CORE when I was leading CORE. He wasn't a member, but he was around and knew about it, and he kind of became a little involved, but not really. Uh, but he and I got to know each other, and so he, uh, he had become a student along with some others at San Diego State, and they started, were trying to start a, a black studies program. And again, more infighting and so forth, and so they couldn't really get it going and everything. So he called me in New York, and I was a, you know, a loan officer there at the bank, and uh, he said, asked me what I, could I, would I be interested in coming back to San Diego? Well, you know, I've been trying to get back to San Diego all this time. So I said, uh, well, it, it, was a, it was a position where I was to be assistant to the president. And I thought about it because Wells Fargo had been holding a position for me also, but they could meet my salary requirement and so I was just kind of waiting that out. But uh, my wife wasn't, she was just as happy as she could be to get back to San Diego. So I said, yeah, so we came back to San Diego and then that's when I started working in September of 1971 at San Diego State. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, I was, you know, my plan was to organize that program, plus some other responsibilities that I had uh, on the campus. But my, my plan was to get into the business area. And, and I understand your hiring then, broke some ground. At yeah, yeah, I was the first black administrator that the university had ever had. And, uh, and also, I, during my first year there, uh, I hired some faculty members. I hired uh, from other uh, who had just finished their, P their PhDs and were doing, working at other universities. And I hired them and brought them to San Diego State. And then uh, we... Uh, 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 established a curriculum. We, we, we established a major and a minor in, and back in that, those years, those were very early years in mm -hmm. black studies. Right and, uh, yep. and, and I was able to get the university to uh, uh, accept our courses uh, uh, to fulfill the general education requirements just like all the others. I mean, that was a major coup. And so uh, that's one of the things I'm most proud of, really. And uh, so we got that major and got a minor and had our general education required, required courses. And we went on, and, and uh, my plan was to do that for a year and then pursue my uh, administrative career, which my goal was to be to, was to become uh, president of a college or university eventually. And uh, I uh, 
had to stay there to do, finish what I wanted to finish in the Afro-American Studies program for two years. And then I, then I left and um, went over into the, uh, uh, became the um, um, director of the computer services for the university. I did the other administrative things on campus. And uh, I left the program, and it was, you know, it's now uh, a full-fledged department. They changed the name to Africana Studies rather than Afro-American Studies. But it's a full-fledged uh, full uh, uh, department in, at San Diego State. Do you still retain ties, at least emotional ties, to... Yeah, e emotional, but I, I've been away and since, well, that was 73, mm -hmm. and... Uh, but that was your baby. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the baby has grown. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but that was, a, that was a good experience. And so how, and then you, so you went on to do other things at San Diego State? Mm-hmm, I became the... Uh, the associate dean uh, of the um, uh, within the uh, within the uh, um, the administrative area. I forget the, the title. I forget now. It was, but it, it was associate dean of uh, uh, in administration. I forget what that was. But then I went on to take. The president asked me to head up the computer services for the university and uh, I did that and then in 1980 I went to become the associate dean in the College of Business Administration and that's where I, I retired from there after I guess 26 years as the associate dean there. And then I went into uh, real estate development, and that's what I'm still involved You're with. Still doing. Yeah. And I retired from San Diego State in 2004, but I had dangled in real estate uh, uh, during my latter years. But I'm, I'm just reminding myself, before that, what I did was uh, in 19... 87, I spearheaded the formation of an organization called uh, the Black, Black Economic Development. And uh, it was called the Black Economic Development Task Force. And I did that for 10 years. Is that just in San Diego? Or? In, San Diego. in San Diego. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did that for 10 years. And then I, uh, and then I uh, as the associate dean, I, I founded um, a, a program, a certificate program in community economic development. I developed a curriculum there and, and um, and use the, um, the faculty there in our college, in our business college, and a couple people outside the university. And that was a very successful program. I did, did that until I retired in 2004. And community members could participate. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, community members. We had a full, uh, it was about an eight-month program. And it, it, uh, it turned out to be, but when I retired again, you know, it went, which I knew it would. I mean, they kept it there because, <laughs> that program because of me, which is crazy. But that's really a fact I knew. And so I knew after I leave, they, they would let it go because they couldn't fund it. I raised funds to supplement what the university put into it in terms of offices and and a couple of people who worked for me but 
to run the program. Uh, you know, I raised funds outside the program, plus it got tremendous publicity and the PR was very good, so the university liked that. But they weren't going to put in a lot of money into the program. And the program could not uh, pay for itself because you just couldn't charge enough to make it, um, uh, to make it pay for itself. Sure. You, you could do it in New York could charge that much, you know, at Columbia or, or NYU and places like that, uh, where I'm familiar with, I mean, their programs, they could charge a lot of money from people would come and pay that money, but we couldn't charge that much for it, so it just couldn't pay for itself, so I knew it wasn't bringing money in, <laughs> they were going to, which they did. Is it disappointing to you to see some of these things you've worked so hard on? Yeah, yeah. but I was kind of used to it, you know, because the the uh, well core disappeared. Uh, I right, I guess I failed to mention that that I founded the uh, uh, a program called leadership training uh, right as I finished core. I did that for a year. Right and then, I went into the Peace Corps, okay. but that was a it was a good program. The leadership training program was really great, and and it got a lot of applause even from the from the Labor Department. Uh, but then that went. I when I went to, into the Peace Corps, they tried to keep it going for a year, but that went poof. Uh, so then I, uh, but I, another thing I left out was, uh, well, the Black Economic Development Task Force, but we did that for 10 years. And then when you're doing this, as you probably are aware of, when, you, when you're in these not-for-profit organizations, man, I mean, you know, and you found them and you're instrumental in really getting things organized, but 90% of the work ends up with you. And so formed the uh, Black Economic Development Task Force that ten, after 10 years, and I said I couldn't do it any longer. It went by the wayside. Then I formed uh, an organization uh, while I was at the, at the business school called, uh, uh, it was an organization to bring together business, the business community, to discuss racial matters. And so I had a couple friends who were very prominent in San Diego, multi-millionaires, mm -hmm. and so I got the two of them to join with me and we had that program where we met once a month at the hotel down there in Mission Valley for lunch. and. Um, had these discussions about race matters, and we finally, after ten years, I got tired, and I, nobody would take my place, and so uh, that went by the wayside. Did so, that group have a have a name too? Yeah, it was called. Uh, uh, it was called. Uh, uh, Club was the acronym Community Leaders Undoing Biases. And that was a good group. People said they really enjoyed that. But the two guys that I brought, uh, I mean, they have their own mm. stuff going on and everything, but I convinced them that they needed to do something in this area. And I said, okay, how? Let's go. You do it. <laughs> We're with you. Right. But they weren't going to get they didn't even make this thing go and keep it going. Right. So that went by the wayside. So everything that I, unfortunately, I, I guess uh, some academicians would accuse me of uh, not uh, following the rules of uh, of, of uh, delegation, <laughs> not being able to delegate. You know. But 
the, the reply to that, I heard someone say, well, but uh, delegate to whom? <laughs> you know, who? <laughs> there has to be people there. <laughs> and most people aren't willing to take on that kind of a burden, man. And it's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, let me ask you then, circling mm -hmm. back, because you said something earlier that, that really caught my attention about, you know, studying what's happened in the past and what's happening now, and then you're the piece that you like to add to it is what should have been. Yes. So looking back on mm -hmm. this amazing career and all of these things that mm -hmm. you've been involved in and, and, and bringing it up to the present mm -hmm. and where we are now and what we're facing now, mm -hmm. what should happen? The first thing is that we need to look at the past and see what happened mm -hmm. and then to kind of find some lessons from that. Uh, as an example, uh, there was a big fight amongst black members of the, of the community uh, throughout the country, I, I think, that uh, not to follow this thing of integration. Uh, that was necessary. It shouldn't be a thing. And as, as I read some time later, uh, that, that core uh, must have been after I left, but they had some in the national um, national committee and the national con convention about you know n not having this as even part of the of the uh, of the constitution and bylaws as having this thing about integration. Uh, well, some people felt that that was the way to solve this problem, of course, and to go through. And others felt that that wasn't the way. So I think we need to learn the lessons back then. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn lessons about uh, what happened. I mean, how, and that's what, you know, I'm hoping to get a, a book written to kind of show, as you've been asking me these questions, so, you know, how do you get to this point where you become uh, a uh, militant or whatever they want to call us back in those days. How do you get to that point? I was a mild-mannered, quiet kid, uh, shy, who was interested in athletics and who excelled in athletics, you know, but that's what I knew. And I said, how did I get to this point where I'm willing to, to sacrifice my life and, and my career and everything else to this point. I wasn't crazy and <laughs> not insane. So I hope to address that and then to get into the future and say, okay, what do we do now? We had the civil rights movement. We had all the past of slavery and post-slavery and leading up to the civil rights movement. We had the civil rights movement. Now, what do we do? There was one area that we really haven't addressed. And the reason we didn't address it, because we, including Martin Luther King and all of them, and Floyd McKissick and, and um, um, the Urban League guy, Whitney Young, and the NWAC, we didn't have the time to even think about doing anything but kicking doors open and, and getting jobs for our people and all this stuff, and getting educated and getting into these colleges and all this stuff. But the one area that we didn't address for a number of reasons was um, uh, this idea of how we fit into capitalism and how we can uh, uh, survive and progress under capitalism. I mean, even if you become a first-class citizen, I mean, that's not enough. So I began many, many years ago to start thinking about building wealth and what that meant. And uh, that's why I started the uh, uh, Black Economic Development Task Force, the Community Economic Development uh, Group at the, at the university and stuff like that, because there's a need 
for us, all of us really, whites and blacks and Latinos, to really understand capitalism, how it works, and what we need to do to benefit from this area. You're not going to replace capitalism, as Bernie Sanders might think, <laughs> think he can do, but or would like to do maybe, but we, we've got to understand it, and then we've got to un understand very strongly that capitalism is a, it wasn't just a word that was thrown up there. I mean, capitalism means something. In the first place, the word capital is very important in our economic system. That's why they call it capitalism. And so a lot of people never, in my, when I taught the class at San Diego State in, in, the, in the program that I founded, they didn't really connect that. I mean, you need capital if you're going to, I mean, if you're really going to be successful in America, maybe you only have a little bit of capital that comes through your savings, you know, but you have to have some savings. You can't spend everything that, that, that comes into your, your household. So my thing is we've got to really focus now on, on, on educating not just getting people an education uh, in high school and, and, and getting them on to college, but getting them some education in this whole area of our economic system and how to survive and prosper in that. And so that's where I think we should be going. And, and as I get into my book, I'm going to have a part of it devoted to pointing that out. This is what, what we should do. We haven't done it in the past. We weren't able to do it. I mean, Martin Luther King, as great as he was, he didn't know anything about economics and business and all that stuff. It wasn't his area. He was in theology. And so we really, I think, have got to, and that's why I started the uh, Black Economic Development Task Force was to get us thinking about, I mean, at that time in 1987, when we started that, I mean, you couldn't get, I mean, black people couldn't even get that out of the black, what? I mean, economics, uh, I mean, they, they, they couldn't form those two words together. And so now they can because we had the program and there's been more around the country about it. But I don't hear about black wealth. Mm -hmm. And we've, many of, of us have been taught that, uh, that wealth is bad. Right. Money, 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 what do they say? Money, money corrupts. just corrupts. Money corrupts and all that. And until, you know, I, in my class, and I explained how money can help. Mm. But you've got to have money to help and to survive. And the more you have through whatever mm -hmm. profession or you decide to go into, through your savings and all that, and through capital, if you're in the real estate development like, like I am, you know, you need capital. You just can't go out there and you, know, you got to purchase land and, and build, and that takes money. And so we, one of the big things that stands in the way of that, of our getting involved in that as a black population, is that we have never learned to work together. Mm. You know, That's other right. than the right. church, mm. you know, we have really, and, and I'm not so sure <laughs> about the church. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of not getting along <laughs> in the church. But, but we need to really focus now on that area and learn how to really be successful. And really, I mean, what I see happening now, which, which, which you know, I hesitate to because I, I, I'm not around the whole, I don't know what's going on around the country that well. But what I see happening is, is that after the Civil Rights Movement, we hit a wall as black people. We hit a wall and we're not doing, we got 
some, some people got some jobs, good jobs. I'm one of them. You know, we got good jobs. My wife got a good job. My friend, our friends you know, in the fraternity, they all have good jobs. But we still have so much poverty and within the black population. We have so much lack of education within the black uh, population. We have so much, so many people under the criminal uh, justice system. You know, I mean, these are all problems that we have that we have not really found a way to address them. Uh, and usually all this stuff, education and all that stuff, you know, takes, takes money. And um, one of the things that we need to learn about capitalism is that, you know, capitalism exists on spending, spenders, and we've become some of the greatest spenders <laughs> around. I mean, black folks spend a lot of their money. In fact, but Tony... They become generators. Of, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. They never, that's right. Yeah. And we're always looking for jobs, but we don't supply jobs, create jobs. In some ways, it's a question of what, what power looks like. Yeah. And power is an equation, and this is a mm -hmm. piece of that. Yeah, equation. exactly. And, and this, it, when you were talking, it reminded me of a conversation I had with a long time, long, long time activist mm -hmm. in Georgia, and I asked him, we were talking about when black pa the phrase black power first started getting yeah. used. Yeah, it's dopey. Him, and yeah, and I asked him what he thought, what it meant to him, mm -hmm. and he said economic power. Mm -hmm. Self-determination and economic yes, power, that's, yes. that's what it's got to be. Yes, you know, exactly. So I was reminded of that when you were Yes. Yeah. You reminded me just now of the term self-determination. That was something that was very strong within me that, um, that, that I, it, it, it just motivated me so much because I could see one day where we would have things in our hands where we could determine for ourselves what we wanted to do. And I think that was one of the problems with me, with the, the peace movement and the Trotskyites and communists and all that stuff, you know. I mean, first of all, they were all white. There were no blacks in, in, involved in that. And secondly, they wanted to impose their will on core. And I mean, I was just dead set against that because I was very, very interested and concerned with self-determination. And I used that term in med meetings in core. Uh, but that's where I see us going. But, you know, there has to be an example. And so when I left, retired from San Diego State, I set out to make an example of how it can be done. And that's why I'm in real estate and land development now. Uh, and I'm with uh, a couple of partners and so forth. I think they have to see it happen. Mm -hmm. And they have to see it happen not by uh, uh, an athlete, uh, not by someone who broke into the movies, a movie star, you know. At, at least they see it happening with uh, 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 I'm, why do I block blocking on these things? These the, the guy in the music industry, these guys, rap, mm -hmm. rap guys, you know, you see it happening. Few here. You know. But we've got to find a way to show our kids that, you know, say, oh yeah, Hal Brown, Mr. Brown is a, is a, is a millionaire. Uh, he is, yeah. Well, uh, who he play for? <laughs> and we, himself. Yeah, himself, <laughs> exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. Right. And they've got right. to see right. examples of that. Uh, our son, who played basketball for Stanford, he, the coach, I guess, had them going out in the community and talking to kids and so forth. So <laughs> our son told us, they said he went out to talk to a group of kids, 
and uh, he was all prepared to talk with them about school and things like that. And uh, before he could really get started, he said, kids raise their hand and said, how much your shoes cost? He had on tennis shoes, you know. Uh, uh, what kind of car do you drive? Just went on and on like that. It was so frustrating for him. I mean, he missed the mark so much, you know. And that's what, I mean, what surprises me, though, is that so much of that still exists mm -hmm. to this day. And I go around, I mean, in my fraternity and so forth, I mean, you know, doctors, lawyers, businessmen, educators, all in high positions. We all had great positions, but no education really in, in uh, business, economics, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, medicine, a lot of doctors, and, and so, but I just think that's, that's the next step. And I said this back in about 19, in, sometime in the 1980s, and I wrote, we, we, we used to have uh, uh, black economic summits. Now, it was my idea, you know, to bring people together and, and talk about economics. And we did that for several years. Uh, and, and in our uh, program, uh, we would always have something from me at the, in, the fr in the front of the program. And I remember talking about, you know, what we should be doing and, uh, and bringing about a, about a, a real Kind of conscious, a consciousness of making economics a part of should be the next step. That's what the, what I use with the next step of the civil rights movement mm. should be in economic development. Well, I thought it was going to take off around the country. You know, I thought I, I saw signs of things happening and so forth, but. Not really. I, I think, you know, we, we hit a wall. And as an example, here in San Diego, and I'm, I must admit, I, I'm, I just don't have a feel for what's going on around the country in the communities and so forth. I know what's going on politically. <laughs> but we just... You know, I, I see a wall, and, and we haven't really, I mean, we've gotten some jobs, as I said earlier, but, you know, that's it. San Diego, when the core days, when we had core, we had a voice. The city fathers and so forth, you know, when things came up, core came to mind. Uh, we don't have a voice now. I just met with the, uh, the well, it's met, I've been talking uh, with the, uh, uh, the president and CEO of the San Diego Urban League, uh, and, and, uh, and, and he wanted to know, you know, get my thoughts and things on how the Urban League could become more effective and so on. And so we've been meeting and so forth, and I put together a group of guys to, as a kind of a uh, think tank mm -hmm. to just sit around and talk with him and so forth. And we did that one Saturday, and we'd probably do it again. But someone has to kind of take the lead, you know, and, uh, and not only in the African-American community, but I mean, it's the same applies for the Latino community, same with the Filipino community, and the same, you know, with the well, Asian. And yeah, I mean, and do you see some potential? Because some, you know, especially with, you are giving the example of CORE and some of the other mm -hmm. groups that, and sometimes it's the seed of anger that, or, you yeah. know, that, that motivates yeah, that. So do you absolutely. see any potential then? You know, with what we see, with, saw with the Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. or with 
the folks who are following Bernie Sanders you talked about. Do yeah. you see any of that emotional, whatever is driving those movements that gives you some hope mm. at all? Unfortunately, no. You know, I don't, and you're absolutely right, and we've said that, you know, years back, you know, there's got to be some anger, you know, or you don't get anything done. Somebody has to do something to cause a lot of commotion, mm -hmm. and then you will get people's attention. But without that, you know, so the only place that I know of that where it can be done is it has to be forced on them in the schools. And I thought the black studies programs around the country would do that, but I mean, I don't see any signs of their knowing. I mean, talking about your project here, I mean, the, the need for it is so great because people don't even know about it. People in my age group, here in San Diego, you say something about the civil rights movement in San Diego, they go, what? I didn't know there was a civil rights movement in San Diego. Uh, and those are the people in, in, you know, my age group should have known about it. Uh, much not, much less not participate in it, they should have really known about it. But then they, but now the younger people, they have no idea. I can remember uh, speaking to a class at San Diego State when we formed the Black, when we formed the Afro American Studies program, and it must have been 1972. And I was asked by one of the faculty members that I hired to come around and speak to this group about their, uh, her class about the civil rights movement and I went in there. They, none of them knew anything. Now that was back then. So we really have a problem, I think. And, and I don't know how else we can do it unless it's force fed through the schools that people See, my goal, one of my goals was in the Afro-American Studies program that, that, that I uh, got organized at San Diego State was to eventually uh, market, it, market it to the total university. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I mean, that it just made sense to me. It just can't be for black students. And so I sort of got ousted a little bit because of some more internal thing. I don't know. I wish they the, the, the could write a, people around the country who, who were much more involved than I and so forth. They could write about this internal stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bet you Jesse Jackson could, and, and, uh, could write a whole lot about it and... Uh, and uh, uh, guy who uh, God, started this, who got involved uh, with starting uh, this project. Mm. Uh, at the, John at Lewis. Charles, I mean, uh, Lewis. John Lewis. John, yeah. John. Yeah. Uh, I bet you they could tell you a whole mm. lot of stories about the infighting mm -hmm. and stuff that went on that sort of kept mm -hmm. the, the progress from being, you know, more than it was. So. I'll tell you, we're still having the same fights and conversations, though, what you were saying about it. Shouldn't, mm -hmm. Black studies shouldn't just be over here, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. stuck in its corner. Yeah. Like the, yeah. These are classes that yeah. should be in the general curriculum. You know, yeah. We're still fighting that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm much older now, more tired, <laughs> more. more better known as worn out. <laughs> well, it is. It does but wear you out, right? It wears you out, honestly. I mean, I, when I finished the Civil Rights Movement, I mean, my, I didn't know what was going on at the time, but when I left CORE, I mean, my nervous system was shot. I couldn't sit and t at a meeting or, or talk to people 
about it. I couldn't, even, my nervous system was completely shot. I didn't realize what was going on, but evidently that was a, close to a nervous breakdown. So. And not uncommon. Yeah, at all. I bet. To talk to other activists. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I bet, man. High stress. Yeah, yeah. It's it's high stress. It's almost post traumatic stress in some, some cases, yeah. You know, you're the first person that I, I, I've thought about that a lot and I've said it to my wife. But, you know, I mean, I don't sleep well. Uh, and I'm, I play back a lot of stuff over all those years. And it hit me one time, you know, I mean, that's what they're talking about, about people coming back from the wars and stuff, post-traumatic stress. Same stuff. It's absolutely the same stuff, yeah. <sighs> and I think it's just oh, beginning, it's... you know, some of the activists are just beginning to recognize that. Yeah. that and, you know, and there are some activists who it tore them apart early up, who, you know, early on. Yeah. Ended up and strung out on drugs or whatever. Yeah, couldn't, exactly. Couldn't, couldn't mm -hmm. deal with it. it yeah. Was, as you said, it can really mess you up. Oh, boy, it can really yeah. mess you up, boy. And, uh, so anyhow, I think that's where we need to go. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the answer. Anyhow, I think that we've got to really get, I mean, we've got to get economic-minded, you know? And, and uh, we've got to, do you remember... Um, Last name was Brown. I'm having trouble. <laughs> I'm where you are right now. <laughs> Whoa. Tony. Tony Brown. You, you know about Tony Brown? Tony Brown uh, had a program on KPBS for some years, uh, and he was, his, his focus was on economics, mm -hmm. black businesses and all this stuff. And, and he, um, there's a, I have a video tape on, uh, on, on, uh, that he put together uh, showing how uh, black spending and how, how uh, blacks only spent 1% or less in, in, the, in those black communities. And this, he's, he's hmm. talking about back years and years. But Tony, I don't know what happened to him. I don't think he died, hmm. but he sort of disappeared. Uh, he put out a movie called White Girl. White Girl isn't what you think he's talking about. He's talking about the drugs that, that was called oh. White Girl. Hmm. And uh, he put out that movie, and uh, I helped him to get it out here in San Diego and, and stuff. But Tony was very uh, active in this area of building black businesses and mm. creating wealth among, he, he may not have used the word wealth so much, but that's what he was talking about, mm. doing that. Uh, so maybe, you know, if, if we had somebody like, on the level of John Lewis, you know, in Congress, which reminds me, I don't know why we don't get this this kind of a message from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, Black Caucus, the Black Congress mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I mean, see, I don't see any leadership coming from them, although I, I mean, I like them, I, you know, I, I love them because they're in these positions and stuff, but I don't see any real leadership coming. When mm -hmm. Jesse Jackson disappeared, well, and then we have, uh, uh, have the, the Rev uh, Sharpton, Sharpton. Mm -hmm. you know, have him, but mm -hmm. you'll see, I remember Jesse used to come out here in San Diego many, many years ago, and he would be talking and talking and talking about you know, and preaching all this stuff, but never, not nothing, not a word about the importance of economics. Back in, I remember saying that back in those years. Hmm. Well, we don't have anybody, you know, in leadership positions to uh, speak to that. Hmm. You know, if I could get my hands on Hillary, I would uh, 
<laughs> twist her arm. <laughs> Hillary, I'll make a $5 donation. Now, listen. <laughs> I'm sure I'll raise you five if she goes along. Yeah, if she goes She's got a website, I understand. <coughs> That's problem. Yeah. true. Yeah, will she ever, you know, where does that go? Uh, oh, well. Interesting world, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Very interesting. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.